Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment of Health Professional Radio. We'll be speaking with Sujal Shah in this segment. He's joining us here, president and CEO of Sima Bay Therapeutics. It's a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company. He's joining us to talk about the positive top line results from their phase three pivotal response study of Celadelpar. Thank you so much for joining us, Sujal Shah. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Neil. Well, well tell us a, a little bit about yourself briefly and um, the company, uh, Sima Bay. Happy to do that. Uh, uh, Sujal Shah, I'm the CEO of Sima Bay Therapeutics. I'm a biomedical engineer by training, spent a few short years academically in an industry on a lab bench, shifted gears, in fact, and spent eight years subsequent to that on Wall Street as an investment banker, helping companies like Sima Bay predominantly raise capital, do mergers and acquisitions and other strategic transactions before deciding I wanted to come back to industry and try to do something I'd never done before and try to get a drug developed and approved uh, for patients with significant unmet need. And I've been at SEMA Bay for the past 11 years through this uh, remarkable journey so far. What unmet need are you focused on currently? Yeah, so, you know, SEMA Bay is a company today that's really centrally focused on developing novel therapeutics for people with uh, rare autoimmune inflammatory liver diseases. And in particular today, we're focused on a rare autoimmune disease called primary biliary cholangitis or PBC. And our lead molecule, Celadelpar, as you mentioned, having recently reported top line phase three data from the response uh, global pivotal study uh, is a compound with which we believe has the potential promise of offering patients benefit around uh, liver health as well as uh, improving clinical symptom burden in this disease. PBC, who does it primarily impact? You know, it turns out that PBC uh, primarily affects women, largely over the age of 40. Uh, so about 90% of people with PBC are women. Uh, as a rare autoimmune disease, uh, although the etiology and the cause of PBC is not fully understood, I think there's evidence uh, to suggest that there's some potential genetic predisposition. The fact that predominantly it's women, there could in fact be some hormonal predisposition. Uh, and again, not unlike really uh, any of the autoimmune diseases that, that are known even outside of liver autoimmune diseases, some environmental fit, uh, trigger or factor uh, that often in combination with some of these other factors leads to this condition. Uh, again, it's predominantly women and usually over the age of 40. As a rare disease, prevalence, for example, in the U.S. is believed to be about 130,000. And just to point out, as you asked around who it largely affects, it's about one in 1,000 women over the age of 40. As a rare autoimmune disease, what occurs in PBC is a patient's own immune system uh, begins to attack uh, the cells that line the epithelial tract of the, of the biliary tree, the small bile ducts of the liver, which are responsible for exporting bile which is generated in the liver uh, to the gallbladder and eventually to the intestine where it's necessary for digestion. And so what happens in patients with PBC ultimately is this immune attack on the small bile ducts of the liver leads to chronic progressive inflammation, uh, destruction of those bile ducts, and eventually an elevation of bile acids in the liver, which can be toxic, in fact, to the liver. Progression in PBC is ultimately from inflammation, to fibrosis, eventually to cirrhosis and the need for liver transplant or some other consequence ultimately uh, that's, that's related uh, to the progression of the disease itself. And so there are only two drugs approved for patients with PBC today. First line treatment is ursa deoxycholic acid, uh, which does help to uh, improve bile flow, lower bile acid pools and lower alkaline phosphatase, a marker of this impaired bile flow. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there are a significant proportion of patients, as many as we believe as many as 60 percent, that never normalize uh, the enzyme levels of alkaline phosphatase that are markers of this impaired bile flow or cholestasis. Those are patients that are effectively at a higher risk of progression. Again, as I mentioned, progression from inflammation to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and the need for liver transplant. 
Today, the only second line treatment approved is a betacolic acid. It's typically uh, prescribed for patients to be taken on top of first line uh, or as monotherapy for those patients that are intolerant. And once again, based on the phase three data for the trials for betacolic acid, only about 50% of patients have what is deemed to be considered an adequate response or an adequate lowering of alkaline phosphatase. The other challenge for the, the only key, uh, the only second line treatment approved today of beticolic acid is that it can actually cause or worsen one of the main clinical symptoms of the disease, uh, which is uh, puritis or this chronic intense itching. So when I think back to your original part of the question around what are the unmet needs, there are multiple. First, there's a need for uh, improved efficacy, bringing uh, levels of alkaline phosphatase lower, and in fact, normalizing uh, this enzyme uh, that is a marker of this impaired bioflow. Uh, lowering that enzyme has been uh, demonstrated to be correlated with potential improvements in transplant-free survival. So this is quite critical. And ultimately, in summation, it's a signal of improving overall liver health. So there's a need for greater efficacy on biochemical markers of disease progression, like alkaline phosphatase. There's a need fundamentally to actually address clinical symptom burden for patients. So today, none of the two treatments actually reduce clinical symptoms for patients. Uh, patients typically experience significant fatigue, brain fog, a level of fatigue that I would tell you, Neil, is quite different than what we all might experience uh, when we haven't gotten enough sleep and we talk about being tired. Mm -hmm. uh, this, in fact, is uh, likely a centrally and peripherally driven fatigue for patients that is unlike anything that, you know, we might have otherwise uh, experienced in our, in our common day lives. And then this intense itching or puritis, you know, uh, as well as other symptoms, certainly dry eye, dry mouth. Uh, so there's an overall uh, symptom burden that really deteriorates quality of life. So ultimately the needs are for further need to improve liver health, but also to address clinical symptom burden. And then finally, always a need to find safer treatment alternatives across the disease spectrum, those that are earlier in disease or even later stage disease. Now, it's my understanding that Sima Bay's recent phase three response data shows some positive results. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to talk about that. You know, we have three key endpoints uh, in the response phase three pivotal study uh, for patients with PVC uh, evaluating cell and LPAR versus placebo. The first was actually uh, a response rate, uh, largely based on alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin, the second was normalization of alkaline phosphatase. Again, one of the ideal uh, functions that we look to achieve for patients or outcomes that we look to achieve for patients. And then finally, uh, the, the third uh, endpoint was evaluating the reduction in itch in patients on celadelpar versus those on placebo. And I'm happy to say that we hit all three of these endpoints with a high degree of statistical significance. And so six out of 10 patients met the primary response criteria a criteria on alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin that has in fact been associated with improved outcomes for patients. One out of four patients, in fact, fully normalized their alkaline phosphatase level over a 12 month dosing period versus zero patients on placebo. And then finally, we saw that those patients that entered the study with moderate to severe itch, effectively a score of four or greater on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of the intensity of their itch level had more than three point reduction in itch at six months versus baseline versus only a little over one point reduction for those patients on placebo. Again, highly statistically significant. And in summary, Neil, I'd, I'd tell you that this is potentially the first time there's a treatment alternative or a potential treatment alternative as we now look to file for regulatory approval where we can talk to patients with PBC about, again, both improving their liver health as well as lowering symptoms burden and then ultimately improving quality of life, something that we really haven't been able to talk to patients about uh, given the limitations of current treatment alternatives. Give us a website where listeners can learn much more, Sujal. Absolutely. So the company, in fact, has just recently revamped its website. So our website is www. Sima Bay, C Y M A B A Y dot com. Uh, there's a rich set of material certainly there, and certainly there are published materials on our website from our own publications, from our own presentations at medical meetings, 
I think from there, people can find a significant amount of information, including in sites like clinicaltrials.gov, where you can see some of our ongoing studies of Celadelpar for patients with PBC. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Sujal Shah. Audio copies of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au, also at Anchor Spotify, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com. Health Professional Radio.